My name is Chris Whitaker. I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of Humber. It's great to have you all come out today. Please join me in welcoming Steve Pakin. This is uh, so trippy. Thank you so much, uh, Pre Mr. President, for that introduction. Uh, I, I guess I should point out, I've, I've been uh, ridiculously fortunate enough to have been given four honorary degrees during my so-called career, but you guys were the first. You guys apparently saw a little something in me before anybody else did, so I'm <laughs> really happy about that. Uh, this is a neat reunion in so many ways. Yes, I'm looking at you, Mr. Hull, because I've known Bob Hull for, well, I think since I was 11 or maybe 12. We were both at the same summer camp together. And to walk in here, I didn't even know you had an affiliation with Humber, and here you are. This is wonderful. Uh, this whole thing started with a conversation, with a five-minute conversation Dean Bellamy and I had many, many months ago. And this is fantastic that it's just happened. I'm overwhelmed at how beautifully you and Kristen, your teams have put this all together. So I think it's great. Brian, whom who's been on uh, TVO a couple of times, numerous times, I think, actually, in the past, back in his CFIB days. That's so neat. Ruth Greer is here. Ruth Greer used to be a weekly contributor to a show I used to do called Fourth Reading, where she was the NDP panelist who used to come in and tell us about what a great job Mike Harris was doing every week on the show. <laughs> well, maybe I misremembered that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Greer, what a pleasure to see you again. And where is Cynthia Good? Because Cynthia Good, okay, Cynthia Good has such an appropriate last name as it relates to my alleged book writing efforts because I think it's about 16 years ago, maybe 17, that you and I had a meeting and talked about writing a book on politics that I was convinced nobody would be interested in publishing because I wanted to write a book that said, here are all the good and noble reasons why people go into public life. Here is the seductive call of politics that I want to write about, but I'm sure nobody will be interested in this. And you and I had lunch together, and you wanted it. And that book begat another book, which begat another book on John Robarts, the predecessor to Bill Davis as Premier of Ontario. And, um, and this is book number seven. And none of this would have happened without you. So I'm so thrilled to see you today. I want to do uh, two very brief things in the time that we have here today. And that is, well, the first thing I want to do is, who lived in the province of Ontario from 1971 to 85 when Bill Davis was Premier? Yes, hands up. OK, good, hands down. Who did not? Who did not live here then? OK. I'm. Actually, all of you veterans, don't take this the wrong way, but I am actually most interested in talking to the people who have no clue who Bill Davis is. Uh, and, and nor necessarily should you, because he's been out of public life, if you can imagine this, for 32 years now. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, he has such a footprint on so many aspects of this province, but the fact is he's been out of our consciousness in some ways for three decades. So I want to just briefly go over some of the highlights of his career, which which frankly, for a man who turned out to be the second longest serving Premier of Ontario ever, really should never have got off the ground for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, re and then after that, I want to tell you a little bit about how this book came together. Reason number one is Mr. Davis ran for his first election at the age of 29 in 1959. Leslie Frost was the Premier. How old are you, Jane? 25. 25. So can you imagine, he, you're a few years older than you, he runs for provincial parliament and he runs at a time when Prime Minister Diefenbaker had just canceled the Avro Arrow. Yes, that was his reaction, although maybe a little more forceful. And you have to understand, he was hoping to represent Peel Riding, where only, I think, about 10,000 people had their livelihoods wrapped up in the Arrow. And he was out knocking on doors saying, how'd you like to vote Tory? Yeah, not so much. Well, he won that first election, which Tory candidates usually won by 10 and 15 and 20,000 votes. He won by about 1,200. So he's in by the skin of his teeth in his first election. But people have got their eye on him because there was a picture taken during the course of that campaign. And in the picture were Tom Kennedy, who was the previous member for Peel and who would be premier for a little while. Uh, there was Leslie Frost, who was the premier of the day, and 29-year-old Bill Davis. And the caption was, past, present, and future. So people had their eye on him. 
Okay. He starts to get a name for himself as an uh, up-and-coming rising backbencher. And then, right near what should have been kind of the crowning moment of his political career, Frost leaves, John Robarts takes over, 1961. Davis is certainly in line for a new cabinet post. His wife died. Many people don't remember this. He had a University of Toronto sweetheart named Helen McPhee, who was his wife. They had four kids under the age of six, and she got sick and died. And he's a widower with four young kids, and he goes to Robarts and he says, I have to quit. I, I can't be a politician. I can't do the job and be a father to these four little kids. And Robarts told him, he was the one person who could call him Billy. He said, Billy, calm down. We're going to get through this together. Just pause and let's see if we can organize your life a little, which of course they did. Had a governess come over from England, helped get his personal life in order. He ended up remarrying a wonderful woman named Kathleen Mackay, who was from Chicago, but whom he knew from their summers together on Georgian Bay. And she took those four kids and essentially, of course, became the only mother they really knew. And then they had a fifth. And she, I mean, the book is dedicated to her because she saved his life. She really saved his life, not just his political life, his, his life life. So, okay, you know some of the story from your president about what happened uh, after that. Robarts put him in cabinet as the Minister of Education. Back then, it was like being, R Ruth Greer would well remember, it was like being the Minister of Health. <laughs> Education had all the money. So 40, I think when you were Minister of Health, you were responsible for spending probably 40, 41, 42 cents of every dollar. That's what education was like in the 60s. And Bill Davis went all over Ontario. He'd open three schools every day during the 60s, during his decade as education minister. It was boom, boom, build, build, build. You know about the college system, obviously. Uh, I mean, what foresight to create the community college system. For the 10% of people who went on to university back then, great. For everybody else, it was after grade 13 and go out and get a job. And, and what a difference in the lives of the hundreds and, well, millions of people who've been through the college system now and who have had that other alternative for post-secondary education, and it was his foresight. OISE, Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, that was created on Bill Davis's watch. Ontario Science Centre, because he thought science ought to be fun for kids, so we got the Science Centre in Toronto. TVO. <laughs> he often jokes to me, it's a good thing I created TVO or you'd have been out of a job the last 20 years. <laughs> anyway, at the end of this period of time, uh, 1970 comes around, uh, he's got, you know, undoubtedly the most, it's either him or Edgerton Ryerson for the most enviable record of education ministers in Ontario history. It's just uh, astonishing. And Robart steps down, and because he's so loyal to Robarts, he didn't do what everybody else in caucus did, which was to set up a leadership organization to get ready to steal the brass ring after Robarts stepped down. So he enters the campaign well behind everybody else. All of the names that you're familiar with, Dalton Camp, uh, Norman Atkins, the big blue machine of the day, were actually not with Bill Davis for that 1971 convention. They supported other candidates, mostly Alan Lawrence because Davis insisted, no organization as long as that man's sitting in that chair. He won by 44 votes at two o'clock in the morning after all the voting machines had broken down and they had to do one of the ballots twice at Maple Leaf Gardens. So, okay, he barely wins his first election. He probably, you know, was lucky to survive politics at all given what happened with his personal life. And he wins the convention to replace Robarts by 44 votes out of 4,000 delegates uh, in the middle of the night. So, you know, no, no real indication at the beginning of this man's life that, you know, great glory and um, destiny were awaiting him. But in fact, that's what happens. I mean, he gets in there as uh, Premier of Ontario, inheriting Robarts' majority, goes to the polls uh, on the strength of many things, including canceling the Spadina Expressway, which made a lot of, you'll forgive me, Mrs. Greer, New Democrats, very happy, but very disappointed at the same time. He stole their best issue away from them. He, he presented himself as a green Tory who had some understanding of urban issues by canceling Spadina. He eventually became the transit man of the year for North America because of his commitment to public transit. But there were also problems. Whose government am I describing? Wins a leadership at Maple Leaf Gardens by the skin of his teeth. Um, 
cabinet scandals, ministerial resignations, legislative committee investigations, police investigations, loss of by-election that had been held by that same party for 30 years, uh, successful education. Who am I describing there? Uh, very good. Very good. Are you hearing those echoes of the current Premier and Mr. Davis? They are all there. The number of similarities between their two first terms is astonishing. And when Bill Davis went back to the polls in 1975 to renew his mandate, they smacked him down. He was lucky to come back with a minority government. Um, you know, ten, I think 10 days before Election Day, he was 10 points back. What did he do? He stole your rent control policy, and that certainly helped. He was not an ideological guy. He was very pragmatic. And as a result of coming back with a minority parliament, he learned how to tack left on some issues to get the NDP support. He learned how to tack right on other issues to get the liberal support. He was not an ideologue. He had good, pragmatic, uh, effective relationships with people on the other side of the, of the House. One of his best friends in that legislative assembly of the late 70s, middle to late 70s, was Stephen Lewis, the leader of the opposition, who carved him a new one on a daily basis. And yet they are still to this day best buddies. This is, you know, 45 years later. Um, just to talk about how astonishing that is, when Brian Mulroney called Bill Davis saying, I need a recommendation for a UN ambassador, Bill Davis recommended the leader of the opposition. Can you imagine Stephen Harper recommending Tom Mulcair for any job like that? I mean, it shows you the different time that we're in now, right? Okay. Anyway, um, because he was the kind of premier he was, six years of minority parliament from 75 to 81, six years, but very stable government. I mean, one legislature lasted two years, the other one lasted four, four straight years. And he ran such apparently good governments that by 1981, when he went back to the polls, he got his majority government back. And if you're keeping score, that's four wins in a row. None of you will remember the last premier before him who won four in a row, because none of you was alive. Okay, Whitney, World War I days, and no one's won four since. So this guy, as an electoral threat, was really pretty impressive. His last term, I want to tell you, but just a few things in his last term, because they really were quite groundbreaking. Uh, that's a bad pun. We got the Sky Dome. Um, Bill Davis sat in the rain with Paul Godfrey, the then Metro chairman at the 83 Grey Cup, and listened to the people shout, we want a dome. And so we got a dome stadium. And when lots of people wanted to put it, you'll forgive me, in Mississauga, or at the CNE, or at the racetrack in North End of Etobicoke, or somewhere else, Davis had the foresight to realize that he didn't want Toronto to turn out to be like so many big American cities where everything went to the burbs and they rolled up the sidewalks at five o'clock in the afternoon. And therefore, he insisted the dome go downtown. And look at what that has begat. I mean, uh, you know, it's been there since 1989. And think about whether all of the development that's happened in downtown Toronto would have happened the way it has, you know, had from April to September, 30 to 40 to 50,000 people not come down there 81 times a year, you know, for baseball games and on we go. So that had a lot of foresight. The other decision, the subtitle of the book, first two words, a nation builder. Bill Davis was a 41-year-old premier in 1971 going out to Victoria, BC to try to renew Canada's constitution. And they got unanimity. And they came home after it was over and it looked like they were going to repatriate our constitution and then it fell apart. Robert Bourassa from Quebec just started to get a lot of heat at home and the deal fell apart. And it took 10 more years before somebody would take a shot at it. And it was Prime Minister Trudeau. For Elisabetta and Jane, that's not this guy. That's his dad, okay? <laughs> that's my Trudeau, not your Trudeau. Okay, my generation's Trudeau. Pierre Trudeau decided to renew the constitutional efforts and he managed to get two premiers, Bill Davis and Richard Hatfield from New Brunswick on side. And it was tense. There was this gang of eight other premiers who were against them and it looked like it was going nowhere. In the middle of the night, not middle night, late one night, Bill Davis calls Pierre Trudeau, and he, Mr. Davis doesn't like my using the word ultimatum, but I'm not sure what else you would call it when he says to him, if you don't put some water in your wine, Prime Minister, I can no longer support you, and this deal will fall apart, so you have to meet me halfway. I'll tell you more about, no, I'm not going to tell you more about that story, you'll have to read it in the book. Anyway. <laughs> 
I'm convinced that the constitutional deal which was arrived at in Ottawa in November of 1981 does not happen without Bill Davis. He doesn't get nearly enough credit for that having happened. The pictures on Parliament Hill of the Queen and the Prime Minister and the Justice Minister Jean Chrétien and the Federal Provincial Minister Michael Kirby, uh, you know, that picture is etched in people's minds. Bill Davis was sitting in the rain in the seats, in the cheap seats with everybody else. He deserved better. He deserves more credit than that. And the last thing, you know, uh, and we can discuss whether or not you think this is a great achievement or one of his biggest mistakes, because it's certainly possible to interpret it both ways. He won the 1971 election with a bigger majority than he inherited from Robarts, in part because when the Catholic school supporters came to him and said, we would like full public funding for the separate school system, when you were education minister, you increased it from grade 8 to grade 10, let's go all the way, do it to the end of high school. And he thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and ultimately said no, because he knew the Tory Corps would have a hemorrhage if he did it. The Tory Corps loved the fact that he kind of stuck it to the Catholics in 71, and that helped him win. Fast forward 13 years. It's June 12, 1984. He gets up in the legislature, and he says, I've changed my mind. And he offers full public funding to the separate school system. Um, how many people here think that was a good idea? Hands up. Hands down. How many people here still agree with everything he said in 1971 that it was going to bring increasing sectarian strife to Ontario, it was going to result in the emptying of our public high schools as Catholic kids no longer went to those high schools and instead went back to the separate school system, that it cost way too much money? How many people are on that side of the argument? How many of you are too chicken to weigh in? I'm seeing <laughs> not everybody put their hand up here. Anyway, it's a measure of how controversial that issue still is that a lot of people don't want to weigh in on it, but he made the decision. David Peterson and Bob Ray implemented it, but because he then retired the following Thanksgiving, but that was that. So he had, in my view, an extremely consequential premiership. Not long after his premiership was over, I started gently nudging him about doing a book uh, because I thought he had a heck of a story to tell. Does the name Claire Hoy ring any bells in this room? Yes, okay, Claire Hoy, was a real muckraking, kind of nasty, small c conservative columnist with a Toronto Sun, who, <laughs> still is I hear, who would have given Mrs. Greer's government an earful on a daily basis. No love lost there. And he didn't like Bill Davis any much more because Davis was far too progressive a conservative for his liking. He wrote a very nasty book about Mr. Davis in the late 80s. Those of you who have studied Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short. That was that book. I always thought Mr. Davis deserved a, a, a fairer treatment of his years, and so I would drop hints over the years saying, you want to do a book? You want to do a book? I covered your last government, you know, you want to do a book? And every now and then I would send him an email like, I just read a book about Les Frost. You know, you actually got mentioned here, 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 and here. Give you any ideas? And he'd have his secretary email back, Steve, I think, um, I think you have given me an idea. I think my idea is that if we ever do do this book, my book has to be longer than Leslie Frost's book because my premiership was longer than Leslie Frost's. <laughs> <laughs> so I would get these little teasing moments here. About three, four years ago, so he's 83, my wife called him and said, you know, Mr. Davis, my husband's not getting any younger. I think it's time you said yes. <laughs> Finally, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I, you know, it was a, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I said, Mr. Davis, you have a duty to history to share your knowledge. You cannot go to your grave keeping all those great stories in your head. And beyond that, are you really going to give Claire Hoy the last word on your life? <laughs> Next day, I got a call from his secretary. Mr. Davis would like to see you up at his home in Brampton. Please bring your notebook. And anyway, we showed up, we discussed. I offered him a number of different options for how we might do this. I was happy to ghostwrite his story. But ultimately, he said, no, this is your book. Write it the way you see it. I'll give you access to all my private papers and knock yourself out. And that's what happened. And the joy of doing this book was getting a lot of face time with the guy who was Premier of Ontario from the time I was 10 until I was 24. He was a very big deal to a kid growing up on the West Mountain in Hamilton, Ontario. And the notion of spending hour after hour after hour with him 
um, at his home in Brampton, at the Albany Club in Toronto, at his condo in Florida, uh, at his cottage on Georgian Bay. I know some of you have been up to the cottage, yes, indeed. Uh, that was really a wondrous experience. I'll, I'll just finish on this because it's not often that something happens, you know, this well. And that is, about 10 years ago, I had in mind an idea of, of having Bill Davis say yes to me to write his story, having editorial control over the manuscript, which I did. He never saw it before it was published. Having a big party once it was done in downtown Toronto where literally hundreds of his friends and family and colleagues and adversaries and, and, and you know, associates from back in the day would come and celebrate this man's life. I would get up and in my mind's eye, I would get up and give a, a bit of a speech, introduce him. He would get up there and slay him you know, with a speech that was funny and touching and lovely and hilarious and solid and strong and, you know, serious, touched all the bases. And then he would get a big ovation. And that's what I envisaged 10 years ago when I really sort of got serious about bugging him on this. And the amazing thing is, that's exactly what happened. Last October. And it went just perfectly according to script. And he got about a two or three minute standing ovation from everybody at this place who just, you know, who gave it to him in part because he deserved it and in part because he's sort of evocative of a better time in our public life and because he's contributed so much. He's 87, a little frail, still lives in the house he grew up in in Brampton, Ontario, Canada. And... Uh, and worth a good book, and I hope this is it. Thank you so much, Humber, for having me today. This was wonderful. My name is Brian Gray. I am chair of the Humber Board of Governors, and I'd like to formally thank you, Steve, for bringing history, uh, the historical life of Bill Davis and his role in the Ontario economy alive for us. It was a long time coming, but it's going to be worth the read. And um, just on a personal note, I'd like to say, Steve, that. You have, um, through your broadcasts and your writings, broadened and elevated the public discourse of complex policy issues of the day. As well, you have put a human face on our politicians, their motivations, their opportunities and challenges, their highs and their lows, their courage, their sacrifice, their strengths and their frailties. This important work has earned you a high degree of trust amongst us. You are truly a national treasure. Thank you, Steve. We have a small gift that we feel will have a special meaning for you, given the focus of your book. If I could call upon Chris to join us. Oh my gosh, look at that, look at that. Wow. Steve, we would like to present you with this gift sourced from our, our archives that includes a picture of a young Bill Davis and a letter he wrote to Humber College in February of 1967. Wow. Let me take a moment to share the letter with all of you. The opening of Humber College, our College of Applied Arts and Technology is truly a memorable occasion. Among 18 more colleges in applied arts and technology to inaugurate a new era in education in Ontario, Humber College remains firmly rooted in the excellent traditions of the past at the same time as it embraces the challenge of the future, the challenge of a constant change and that distinguishes our age of technology. Humber is dedicated to the double aim of education, leavening the economic and social with the cultural and the humane. Closely identified with the community, student-oriented, and enlightened by continuing research and experimentation, Humber College is committed, through its philosophy of total education, to the identification and fulfillment of the latent abilities and highest aspirations of secondary school of graduates and adults. That the de dem democratic ideals of the province and the nation may be vindicated and it's signed the Honorable William G. Davis, Minister of Education. Wow. 50 years ago, 50 years ago last week. 
Before I conclude the formal speaking portion of this engagement, I'd like to emphasize what Chris mentioned earlier. This year we are celebrating Humber's 50th anniversary as a leader in post-secondary education. You have a part to play in this celebration. I invite you to read about Humber's story on our website and in our publications. Join us for more exciting anniversary events. Browse our photo galleries. Help us build the next 50 years. Stay in touch and support Canada's leading polytechnic institution. Now, more than ever, we are committed to blazing new trails and creating a better world for all of us. Thank you all, and please enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.